Welcome to part 2 of chapter 14 video presentation devoted to information system security. In part 2 we will talk briefly about some of the typical technical solutions to information system security, the role of the so-called chief security officer, uh, we will also talk about some approaches to information risk management, and finally, we will talk about the role of certain legislature for ensuring that every organization has adequate information system security controls. Now, we said before that a lot of the security breaches happen not because of technical glitches, not because of technical vulnerabilities or technical knowledge of the intruder, but because of, uh, of the great social engineering skills uh, on the side of the intruder. In other words, people figure out how to deal with people on the inside of organizational boundaries to get valuable uh, confidential information from them that can be further used for unauthorized access of information systems assets within that organization. So yeah, I think uh, some of the uh, findings that I remember is that up to 80%, something like that, up to 80%, of security breaches uh, happen as a result of social engineering and not any kind of technical vulnerability. But nevertheless, there are a lot of technical solutions out there to prevent security breaches. And we'll, it, it's a vast topic. I mean, people you know spend their entire career specializing in some of those tools. So, we'll, so we'll, here we'll have a very brief high-level overview of the kind of tools uh, that are available for ensuring information system security. And the discussion will be roughly uh, corresponding to the layers of the uh, OSI model. OSI is a communication model that outlines how computers talk on the network, what, which uh, layers or levels a message sent over a network goes through. So it's, it's uh, it, again, OSI model is another, is another big topic. Uh, a lot of data communications professionals, information security professionals, I mean, they're, uh, you know, they have a very intimate knowledge and understanding of the OSI model because their their work is largely about working within those layers. And um, a lot of security companies, when they interview people for security roles or data networking, data communications roles like networking roles, a lot of times during interviews they ask questions about the OSI uh, model. So, but but those levels they only roughly correspond to the OSI level. So let's talk about different levels of security or technical protection that organizations can have against unauthorized access to their information systems resources. So at the perimeter level, meaning something that is outside, it's like a wall that, that protects uh, uh, an organizational network against unauthorized access, companies can have things like firewalls. A firewall can be a software or, or a physical box like a server that filters, that constantly listens to the packets, to the messages that come, come from the outside into the organizational network and tries to block messages that are unauthorized or look suspicious. So that's what firewall is. It's about blocking, uh, un blocking unauthorized access by detecting uh, suspicious packets and, and not allowing them in. Um, another security mechanism used at the perimeter level is the so-called VPN encryption. So when you're trying to connect to your organizational network remotely, let's say from the house, you use a VPN connection. A VPN connection is like a tunnel that is created with the help of encryption. So that, that tunnel opens up and you, talk to, and you talk to your organizational network from a remote connection securely because uh, the communication is encrypted, meaning uh, encoded uh, using a cert certain keys. And even if somebody intercepts your, your message, most likely they won't be able to decode it. Some organizations also use uh, network-based antiviruses that, that scan the entire network traffic for possible uh, suspicious packets that may comprise uh, you know, a virus or, or some kind of security, uh, uh, security breach attempt. Then you have the level of the network itself within an organization. It can be a local area network or wide area network. So a lot of organizations have intrusion detection systems. Again, those systems, they listen to packets. Uh, they monitor network traffic, what's happening on the network, and, and, and they have those patterns embedded into that. In, in other words, they can detect if something suspicious is happening and, and your uh, network can be under a possible at, uh, attack. Also, uh, some organizations in, uh, employ vulnerability management systems. You know, they're like scanners. You know, they look at your network and they detect vulnerabilities. 
Uh, of course, uh, network, <clears throat> network access control is used nowadays universally where in order for you to gain access to a network, you need to authenticate yourself. So, so this is something that is used at the network level. Now, at the level of host security, meaning individual computer, individual server or router or whatever the node that is comprising your network, you can have an intrusion detection system at the host level. And also you can have a host level antivirus. Again, that scans your systems and system, your, your, let's say your, your individual computer, your laptop or your desktop computer and tries to detect whether something is going on there and needs to be addressed. Then at the level of individual software applications, uh, public key cryptography or encryption is heavily used. Uh, again, encryption means taking a particular message and changing it encoding it using uh, 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 different symbols to the point where if somebody gets a hold of that message or that data, they won't be able to read it. They won't be able to make uh, sense of it because it uses a different code. Again, it's a vast topic like those algorithms of how public key cryptography works uh, so that uh, communication at the application level is secure is a vast topic, but it's about, it's largely about encoding, decoding message using uh, private and public key so that even if that message is intercepted, it cannot be read by an intruder. And the same uh, protection is used for data, where if you're storing some data on your computer, you can also encrypt it so that nobody can open it and read it because it's, it's uh, encoded using a particular system. Uh, when I work for, uh, for a software company, um, our, our CEO, he was very much obsessed with security. He was afraid that the, the intellectual property of the company would get stolen. And he would actually require uh, uh, he would actually require for all email messages uh, to be encrypted among employees, and also the requirement was that whatever organizational data that you are using, it also has to be encrypted on, on your on your computer as well, because a lot of people were working remotely and they had very sensitive data on their personal computers. Um, I remember because I worked in in software quality assurance, I had basically the entire code for at least one or two of their flagship products. So uh, there was little uh, that was preventing me from just taking that code elsewhere and, and basically stealing most of their business you know, through that code. And of course I wasn't going to do that, but I was worried that somebody will gain access to it because I had a lot of code stored on my computer. So yeah, I, I was diligent about uh, encrypting uh, not only all of my messages, but also all of the data that was, all of the company related data that was stored on my computer my personal computer. Uh, we used, uh, uh, I think the solution was called PGP Privacy, Pretty Good Privacy. So that was the name of the application and, and the algorithm. So the way it works is that you create like a hard drive and you need to use a, a certain password to open that hard drive on your own. So it's like an extra hard drive that you use and that's where you store all the organizational data. And then for email messages, again, you exchange those uh, keys and all the email messages I used, uh, I send in encrypted format, and it's only on your computer that you, you know, decipher, decode that message and, and read what the other person is saying. If somebody looks at your message without having uh, access to the, to the keys that, that, are, that are needed to decipher that message, they won't be able to make any sense of it. You know, there are some uh, estimations that saying if you want to do it like in a brute force where you can, you just try in different combinations and you're trying to guess it, even if you're using a supercomputer, it may take you hundreds, if not thousands of years to guess that key and, and break somebody's encryption. But again, it's, it's like, you know, security, it's, it's always it's like a never ending process. You know, there are solutions being developed and then some vulnerabilities are discovered in those solutions. So whatever you believe in right now, whatever you say right now regarding uh, the level of confidence that you have, I mean, it may change fairly soon if somebody discovers another way of, uh, hacking into the system. So things change in information security field really fast. Okay, so so yeah, those are some technical solutions that are typically used by organizations to protect their information systems assets. To, to, to have a person in charge of both technical and managerial solutions to uh, information system security uh, problems, many organizations create the role of, of the so-called chief security officer or CSO uh, this person is responsible for continu continually assessing an organization's information security risks largely and also for developing and implementing effective countermeasures to those risks. So, so this key role uh, it can be broken down in the following steps or key tasks. So the main, one of the main goals of a chief security officer is to identify and prioritize relevant risks. 
Also to eliminate essentially avoidable risk with reasonable investments, meaning the risks that are very clear and that can be easily eliminated with minimal or reasonable uh, expenditures of financial and non-financial resources. And also try to mitigate other risks to an appropriate point of diminishing returns on security investments. Uh, to, to explain that point of diminishing return, you see uh, risks, security risks or any kind of risk, they can never be eliminated completely, right? There is risk in everything that you do. Uh, you know, if you stay at home, you, you minimize the risk of getting in, uh, infected by COVID, let's say, but you maximize your risk of some kind of uh, household injury, let's say sleeping in a shower, you know, because you spend a lot of time in the house. So, so, the, so, so risk in your life can never be zero, right? Um, and another difficult thing, uh, another thing that makes managing risk complicated is that investments into minimizing risk, they're subject to the law of diminishing returns, which means that if you have no uh, uh, measures in place to address possible risk, then your, your risk is very high. And then with certain minimal investments, you can do like basic things, you know, you can buy, purchase, like let's say if you're talking about information security, you can purchase like antivirus software, you can purchase VPN solution, you can start using user authentication. So those things are not very expensive and they, they, ha they have a lot of uh, bang for the buck. In other words, they can dramatically decrease the risk that you're facing with very minimal investments. So, so your risk may go down, let's say from 100% to, uh, to 10%, right? But then if, you, if you're trying to decrease risk even more, what will happen is that you'll spend more and more uh, money and, and non-financial resources on risk mitigation, but the, 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 dec the corresponding decrease in risk will not be proportional to your investment. So you invest a lot, but the risk decreases are very minimal to the point where some organizations decide to stop it at an acceptable risk level. Again, that depends on, on the organization. I mean, of course, if it's a nuclear plant, or something related to national security, then they will spend a lot of money trying to bring risk down by 1%. But if it's a small business, I mean, they will stop at a particular level and they'll say, look, we're no longer willing to invest invest because the law of diminishing returns applies here. We invest a lot, but we get very little in return. And then just that, that investment doesn't do much for us anymore from a financial and risk standpoint. Now, overall, I find this topic of uh, trying to analyze risk and prepare risk to be fascinating, fascinating from an intellectual standpoint. You know, I've done some work about like predicting risk, predicting disruptions. The reason I find it fascinating, it's an interesting question, right? How do you prepare for something that you don't know? How do you prepare for something that cannot be prepared for by definition, right? Um, if you want to have like a very practical and philosophical and also very entertaining and deep exploration of the topic of risk, I would like to recommend the following books for you. Uh, all of those books are written by Nassim Taleb. Uh, he, in my opinion, he's one of the uh, most prominent modern philosophers of science, although he's more like a public figure. He's known for his provocative st stances on a lot of issues related to politics and finance. Well, anyways, his name is Nassim Taleb. The first book that he wrote is called Fooled by Randomness. Uh, I promise if you read that book, it will change the way you look at risk in your life, in your work. You know, it will really change you as an individual and, and hopefully it will make you a happier person as well because you will be able to understand risk better and be more comfortable dealing with it. So the first book is called uh, Fooled by Randomness. Great book. Uh, if you like the first book, then I recommend uh, the Black Swan book. Um, uh, using that uh, metaphor for Black Swan, uh, Nick, uh, Nassim, Nassim Taleb explains the, uh, the impact of unexpected, unpredictable events on companies, on individuals, on organizations, and then he calls those unpredictable events black swans uh, for a reason that he explains in the book. And then finally, so th the first two books, they help you understand risk, and the final book that kind of gives you some solutions on how you prepare for, the, for, for things that cannot be prepared for, it's called Anti-Fragile. Anti so how do you make yourself as an individual and organization less fragile, less uh, uh, prone to uh, possible uh, uh, security incidents or risk, whatever, whatever form th those risks may take? So that book contains like an, a possible answer, like some solutions to, to risk. So this is what I recommend. And it goes well beyond, you know, it actually doesn't deal with information system security. It goes well beyond. So... Uh, but again, you will learn a lot from the, from the, from this book about risk. You will learn about biases that people have in, in relation to risk. Uh, one biases that people have is that they, they 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 tend to be like blind to things that are outside of their domain. 
So the thing that risk has one dimension, right? For example, one, uh, well, one illustrations of that that Nassim Talib gives is that, you know, casinos, they're very good at when it comes to calculating gambling risks, like, right, how much money they can lose, how much money they can win. But sometimes they overlook the physical aspects of risk. For example, one casino faced a problem, I guess maybe that's not the right term for a problem. They, they faced a terrorism uh, incident where, uh, a person who lost a lot of money came back drunk and he basically had a bomb and he blew up almost the entire casino, right? So that's something they could not calculate, right? That asymmetric response to the risk of losing uh, money in a casino, right? So asymmetric means like it's something that is not expected, right? I mean, you, you, you expect people win or lose and, and do things within the gambling realm, but they do something within the physical realm, right? Or something along the lines... You install all kinds of software, VPN, firewall, um, I don't know, antivirus software, you use encryption on your computer, and then somebody comes in fit, like dressed as a maintenance company and they load up your computer on a truck, on your server on a truck, and nobody says a thing because they, you know, they expect the maintenance company to do something like that. And then they just steal the entire thing from you, right, without uh, bypassing like all those software uh, protections that you may have, right? So this is something, again, you may not think about because you're thinking about information systems risk. You're not thinking about theft, right? So, yeah, that's one of the reasons why as to why risk cannot be completely eliminated because it just has so many dimensions. And oftentimes you are, you are just not aware of all those dimensions of risks. Now, um, one of the main goals of a chief security officer is to uh, manage risk. And here we have a list of uh, like a rough uh, list of risk management steps and also the steps that an organization or, or a security leader needs to go to through to prepare uh, uh, an organization for a particular type of risk. We, but again, determining all possible types of risks that your organization may be facing can be quite difficult, if not impossible. So one approach can be something like that. Determine the organization's information assets, you know, what's, what kind of uh, targets of that risk you're considering and also their value. Now, by value, we typically mean financial value, but sometimes financial value can hardly be estimated. So some organization may think in terms of length of time, the organization can function without a given information asset when it comes to determining the asset's value. And then once you know the assets and their value, you know, you, you'll be able to prioritize how important those assets are. And then you will, based on the priority list, you will develop and implement security procedures uh, that are proportional to the priority and value uh, uh, assigned to your information assets. So this is one example. So let's say your organization determines that if an employee loses a laptop, you know, that uh, security incident costs you approximately $50,000. Maybe uh, that $50,000 is devoted to data recovery, maybe legal fees or something like that. But that's your uh, approximation. And then what you can do, you can multiply that number, that value, single loss expectancy, you know, is how much it will cost you to lose a single laptop, by the annual occurrence rate, meaning how many incidents like that usually occur within your organization. So, for example, it costs you $50,000 to deal with an incident of an employee losing a laptop. And then, let's say, every, uh, every two years, you have three incidents like that, so you have 1.5 incidents per year. So that's the cost. Of that of that uh, risk, you know that's that uh, that's your annual uh, annu annualized expected loss in relation to that particular asset. Now, once you know that annual expected loss in relation to a particular asset or an asset group, you can do a rough cost benefit analysis, and you do it by subtracting uh, annualized cost of action. So, in other words, you have that risk, and then you calculate how much it will cost you to address that risk, and the difference between the two will be your net benefit or the so-called return benefit. So, let's say you know that adding strong encryption to corporate data on all, to all of the laptops will cost you $100 per year for each of the 200 laptops in the company. So, so if everything is encrypted, then, uh, you know, then it's, it's likely that the, that the loss, the annualized expected loss will be eliminated. Although it's like a very uh, unreasonable assumption because just because you use encryption does not mean that people will, will properly use it. So, but again, for the simplicity of the experiment, we'll assume that once you install that encryption on all, on all of your laptops, that uh, annualized expected loss will be eliminated. Uh, you know, it will be uh, uh, close to zero. So now, so it will cost you uh, $20,000 to install that encryption on, on all of your laptops. So if you subtract 
$20,000 from the uh, annualized expected loss and $20,000 is your annualized cost of action. If you sub subtract it from the annualized expected loss of $75,000, you get return benefit or net benefit of $55,000. So again, you can, do, you can do this analysis for all of your assets and then you will determine where you'll get the, the highest net benefit to, to prioritize your uh, risk management investments. Now, a lot of times, uh, security incidents, privacy incidents cost a lot of money uh, due to the legislature. There's a lot of legislature out there that governs how data should be handled and protected. And a lot of that legislature uh, has very specific fines uh, outlined so that when an organization does not properly manage risk, manage information assets, they get penalized from a financial standpoint. Again, there are many acts out there. I'm not familiar with all of them. A couple of them that I'm familiar with, that I'm familiar with, I'll just talk about them briefly. Probably one of those acts worth discussing is the so-called Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Uh, this is something that is largely related to accounting, although since nowadays accounting is so uh, is very much driven by information technology, information systems. It touches a lot on information systems, especially when it comes to uh, information security controls. Now, as you probably know, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Act, or SOX, it was, uh, uh, it was initiated in response to several accounting standards, scandals involving such organizations as Enron and WorldCom. Again, if, if you want to get a great read on the subject, it's a really great book. Uh, it's called uh, The Smartest Guys in the Room. There is also a documentary based on that book by a company, production company called Magnolia. So I recommend both. There's a, it's an excellent book, an excellent documentary. It asks a very uh, important question. Why do smart people do unethical things? I think this book had had a lot of impact on business education. Uh, I know that Harvard, after Enron scandal, after that book was written, they revised their curriculum to include uh, heavier emph emphasis on ethics. Uh, one of the reasons was that it was, a, uh, you know, it was a big scandal, but I think the main reason was Jeff Skilling, the CEO of Enron, uh, the guy who did most of those unethical things. He was actually a Harvard Business School graduate. He was one of the best MBA graduates from Harvard Business School. So everybody was asking, how come Harvard taught him so many things, but not ethics, right? So it's a great book, very fascinating, touches on very important topics in relation to ethics and, and human nature and things like that. So I highly recommend it. Well, anyways, uh, I had like an <clears throat> indirect exposure to Enron scandal because I was a doctoral student in Hu at the University of Houston. And I drove a couple of times uh, through their headquarters that were in Houston downtown. And I saw some people protesting there because as a result of that accounting scandal or uh, accounting scandal was like one of the main reasons for that uh, bankruptcy of Enron. A lot of people lost their, their pension savings, their 401ks and things like that. So there are a lot of protesters. Now, Ken Lay, uh, the founder of Enron, he was one of the graduates of the University of Houston. He got a PhD in economics from the University of Houston. And overall in Houston at that time, he was like that fatherly figure to all the business people. He was viewed as unofficial leader of the business community of Houston. And I know he was friends with the George Bush family and things like that. To make the story short, Ken Lay was so embarrassed to go on trial in his uh, you know, hometown, adopted hometown Houston, he stopped, according to his wife, he stopped taking his blood pressure medication uh, while in Colorado in, in his uh, you know, ski lodge or something like that. And he died from a stroke. And, and you know, his wife kind of hinted that it was like a suicide because he was too embarrassed to, to be prosecuted in Houston. Um, so, yes, well, one of the things that happened with Enron is that uh, Jeff Skilling, the CEO of Enron, he tried to blame everything on Andy Fastow, who was the CFO, chief financial officer of, of Enron. And he kept saying something like, look, I'm a CEO, I'm a business guy, I'm running energy business. I had no idea what Andy Fastow was doing. He was manipulating all those numbers to, to cook a profit every quarter. Well, I mean, it was hard to believe. And Sarbanes-Oxley, basically, one of the requirements of Sarbanes-Oxley Act is that uh, all uh, C-level executives, including the CEO, they need to, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure about all, but the CEO for sure required to attest all financial statements so that they cannot say, oh, I didn't see anything. I didn't know anything about finances. So that was number one. And the other thing that happened uh, with Enron is that when they knew that they were about to get busted, uh, they spent, uh, I think it was them plus their auditor, which is Arthur and Anderson, which was one of the big five 
uh, accounting firms at that time. I think it was both of them. They, they spent the whole night shredding all the documents related to Enron. So Arthur and Anderson deleted, you know, shredded all the records related to Enron so they could not get prosecuted. Uh, again, uh, one of, as in, response to, in response to that, uh, one of the requirements of Sarbanes-Oxley Act is that all financial data has to be securely stored. So you cannot say in court that, oh, dog ate my financial statements. I don't have access to it, right? So you're responsible to store them for at least five years so that if somebody wants to go back and check your financial data, they can do that. So since nowadays uh, data is stored mostly electronically that has direct connection to information system security, you cannot get away by saying, oh, you know, somebody hacked into our system and deleted all our financial data because you'll be responsible for that security breach because you didn't have a proper information system security controls in place and you will be fined or maybe you'll get some prison time as, as this uh, you know, uh, table uh, mentions. By the way, Jeff Skilling, uh, the CEO of Enron, he got, I believe, 27 years of jail time. So given his age at that time, he was like in his 50s or something like that. Uh, everybody thought that he would never get out of jail. Well, I was, I, I was actually, I was kind of following him over the years because, again, I had this indirect exposure to the Enron scandal. It looks like he got out of jail already. So he didn't spend 27 years there. He spent, what, less than 20 years, I think. So I, mean, I may be wrong, but you can ch check Wikipedia article. Now, Andy Fastow, the CFO, because he cooperated, he basically you know testified against all of, all of those senior leaders like... Jeff Skilling, Ken Lay, and many others. He got away with 10 years of jail time. I think he served a bit less than that. And now he's lecturing. He's actually giving lectures to universities about ethics. So that, that's one of the things that he does. Now, I was actually surprised to, to find out that one of the chief traders for Enron, meaning the guy who was doing a lot of fraud, I mean, although it, it wasn't like, he was just like a, I guess, rank and file employee, more or less. I was a bit surprised that a few years after Enron trial, after scandal, he started another energy trading company in Houston. And the next thing everybody knew, it was a billion dollar trading operation again. So I was like, well, is he doing the same thing he did in Enron again? So it's a fascinating story. I highly recommend you read, uh, read, read the book, The Smartest Guys in the Room, or watch the documentary. Now, another act uh, that I'm some, somewhat familiar with is Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It has to do with a lot of uh, regulations in relation to healthcare data, but largely it's about protecting privacy and confidentiality of patients. So if you don't, if you're a healthcare organization, you're subject to the HIPAA Act, and if you don't uh, protect uh, data, uh, you know, data related to, to your records in relation to treatments of patients, then there are very tangible fines and even in, imprisonment for any kind of security breaches that are a result of your negligence when it comes to protecting the data. So those are the acts that I'm familiar with. I'm not that familiar. I mean, I'm kind of a little bit familiar with the Patriot attack. You're probably familiar with it too. But I get to skip all those slides that go into the details of those acts and what kind of penalties um, you know, they outline for those organizations that don't have proper information systems, uh, security controls in place. So I'll, I'll let you go through those slides on your own.